So we're gonna talk about um, the refinement now that we got the kind of bulk uh, approach at it. So um, we're gonna answer the um, last couple of items on the overview from the first presentation. Um, and in particular, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, break lines and refinement regions, which are we're gonna find out are gonna be a very similar activity. Um, and what we're looking at here is a mesh that is not honoring something it looks like it should be honoring. So there's the river running um, from east to west there, and then there's a large linear feature which looks a lot like a levee. And there's a couple things about that is one, well, it looks like a levee, but it also does not look like a great levee. Um, so we're gonna need to do a couple things to, to tackle that. And the first one is we need to um, enforce the way the mesh is constructed. So if we consider the cell right here, kind of in the middle, that it's got a face up here in the overbank and the city behind um, the river and the river's right here. And then we got a couple of faces from there to there. So the basic problem here is with the one which we've talked about a bit already and we're gonna continue to talk about is you need to know about and be aware of this and the finite volume methodology because what that keeps track of is that, hey, water was over in the side of the river and it could pass through this face and if this face is lower, then it says, oh, well, water can pass out of that face. <clears throat> so um, we need to make our faces line up with the uh, with all the uh, high ground and ridges and in particular, constructed things like levees. <clears throat> and really, because we need to constrain to keep water from going out over there. Um, so is there a case where we, well, I guess I have my thoughts at the end of this. There, um, when we might not want to um, uh, feel like we need to, okay, so there we go. Now oh, there's the the animation to go with that story. Um, so we're gonna put in a break line that looks something like that. And then we're gonna re reinforce the mesh so that it looks something like that. <clears throat> and that is not at the end of the story, but that is a good way along because if we look at the mesh down through here, we can see that the terrain data is not accurate enough to because it's really unlikely that that really is what the levee looks like. It's probably a flat road. And if we looked at it in Google Earth, that's what we would see. But the mesh data, the raster data, was not accurate enough to, to um, account for that. Um, so we're going to line up our faces through there. And then later, we're going to do another property where we um, enforce a different station elevation data than we got from the terrain through there. Or we could go use one of the terrain vector ads, which is new to version 6, which would put it in, into the terrain. And then we wouldn't need to do anything special. Okay, so uh, snapping, it's part of mesh generation. Um, and again, snapping is in quotes and enforcing is quotes on the next bullet. So they're, they're both more like guidelines and that when we put a brick line in, we are encouraging the, mesh, the final step of the mesh generation to move faces over to be on top of those uh, requested um, brick lines. But they don't, it doesn't always work out well. And this is one of the reasons why you end up putting smaller um, uh, cells a, a finer spacing around cells to account for how the curvature works out in our mesh generation. And we'll get some, we'll talk about that and then you guys get some experience with that in the in the lecture to come. Um, so the enforcing part of that is when we move the faces um, that are near a break line to try to get them to, li to line up with that break line. <clears throat> and uh, so we, we snap to them or if they're too far, we don't snap to them. And the last note says it's not perfect. It might require tighter cell spacing and or some hand graphical editing. Okay, so how do we go about doing that? And break lines are just a polyline layer that is stored in, a, in, the, in the area of the tree of the 2D, um, 2D flow areas in the um, in ResMapper window. Or there's an analogous thing in the other part of the VB6 window, you can do similar kind of things. And um, each polyline break line has a, um, a unique name, and it, it, I think they just call break line one, two, three, or something when you start adding them. But if you're, if it's, if it really is a levy, then you might actually call it the name of the levy. That way, it'll help you figure out what it's actually, um, uh, what that break line is for, what that polyline is representing. And then it's got those columns in that data table. So it's uh, near spacing, near repeats, far spacing, and enforce one cell protective radius, protection radius. And um, so the near spacing, that is the, we're gonna go along that polyline and we're going to, we're gonna uh, cleverly place new cell centers um, 
offset at that spacing. And sometimes we want it to go more than one deep. That has to do with the repeats. And we have some slides to show you what these things look like. And then um, we're going to double until we reach or exceed the far spacing. The far spacing is optional. If you don't put it in there, then it'll continue doubling until it reaches the background cell spacing of the, of the 2D mesh. And turn on if you want to in, um, enforce uh, a one cell protection radius around the brake line so that a neighboring brake line does not delete cells that your brake line needed. Um, and we'll, we'll, see, we'll see that with some, um, some views here. So the process is now that you've got that uh, polyline added to internal to your mesh, um, what we do is we look at the, the, uh, the spacing requirements you're going to do, and we go and offset that polyline, and then we delete all the existing points in there. And then we uh, add them in such a manner that they are equal and opposite distance as we kind of march along the polyline. Um, so we look at the polyline length, if it was 110 feet and we wanted to do them at uh, 25, then we would um, say, well, 110 is not divisible by 25, but 125 is divisible by five. So then we divide the 110 divided by five, which we would get 22. And then, so every 22 feet along there, we would end up with a cell that we would, we would put, um, we would go half that distance off and put a cell center along on either side. And that would encourage the brake line to honor or the cells faces to honor that brake line. And I keep needing to put like air quotes around things because it doesn't always work. Um, it's not guaranteed, but we try to make it work. Um, so the we compute how far out we need to go, we delete the points, and then we add them again um, that follow that brake line. <clears throat> and there is influence from one brake line to another if they get close enough. And we tried not to have one enforcement of one brake line destroy the nice setup of another brake line. <clears throat> and furthermore, um, when we are marching out to delete points, if we come across a brake line, we don't delete them on the other side of that brake line. That's what that last bullet is about. Okay, so here's a, a couple of pictures of what that looks like. So if we had a grid spacing of 100 feet and we happen to draw the line perpendicular to that, then it would snap over to it and that would be great. Um, if we said, well, I want to have a near spacing of 50 feet, then this is the second image is what we would get. And you can kind of see if we focus in on what's happening at your, your transition. So we have two cells 50 feet apart, and then we're going to be heading towards 100 feet on the background. And this kind of break, we have a, end up with a five-sided polygon, um, a five-sided cell. And we still end up with a perpendicular face that is perpendicular between there and there, and perpendicular between there and there. And then this face is perpendicular between here and here, and this face is perpendicular between there and there, and so on. So we still end up with the properties of the mesh we want, and growing at a two to one ratio turns out to be good for a lot of computation regions, um, and just the ones I was talking about as well. Okay, what, else, what happens if we do a repeat? Um, so then we take that spacing and we do it, in this case, two repeats. So the first one is not a repeat. So the this is the first one you get if you enforce the break line. That's, this, this column is the first repeat, that's the second repeat. Um, and in this case, we could uh, go out to a far spacing of 200. So we, um, if we didn't put that in, then it would stop. It would realize that, oh, the background spacing is 100. So when after it repeated, got to 100, that would stop. But we could force it to keep going and doubling and, um, and get a, a refined region around the polygon and then an unrefined region around that line and then back to our background cell mesh. I don't think you would actually want to do this, but it, but it, it, you have uh, the tools to make to do all these options if you want to. <clears throat> okay, so those are break lines. And then we have another tool, which is called the refinement region. And it's kind of like a combination of what happens in the, um, the break line and the main perimeter. The basic difference is that uh, you can specify your own cell spacing inside of a refinement region. And Essentially, it solves what it did on the whole problem on a small polygon problem inside of the 2D area. Um, so when the process of enforcing a refinement region, the first thing it would do is it would say, well, I've got my big mesh, I've got a, point, a bunch of points, but I want to put a bunch of points in it at uh, 50 feet by 50 feet. So it would delete everything in there. It would put them in and make new points at 50 by 50. And then it would go through and apply the break line process. So then it would uh, then delete points along the, the perimeter, both inside and outside of the refinement region. 
And then you uh, would do the same thing we did with near repeats, far spacing, and cell protection, just like we did with brake lines. <clears throat> so the refinement region gives you an opportunity to have a sub-region that has a like 100 by or 50 by 50, where in maybe the bulk of your model it was 100 by 100 or something like that. This gives you an opportunity to quickly put that together. Okay, so kind of analogous to what we did before is we have a 100 by 100 background, and then we drew a rectangle in there, and we said, well, I just want to have a cell spacing of 50 by 50, so it would do high res that resolution on the inside, and then it would honor it would do the same thing on the um, uh, it would do that spacing on the perimeter, and in this case, we are saying, hey, I want to refine this region. There's something interesting happening here, and I want it to be refined. Um, maybe this is over your, uh, near a breach or something like that, or a culvert outflow or something like that, and you want to have a bunch of cells, you could do that this way. Another common one is uh, the second one, and this is um, we have a background of uh, 100 by 100, or no, sorry, background 100 by 100, but I, I'm saying I want to unrefine this area in the middle. Um, and then the second one is we're, again, desiring to unref unrefine, but we're, we want to have the uh, transition on the edges to be um, 100 foot spacing instead of um, uh, 200 by 200. Okay, so um, why would you want to go about doing that? Um, that the mesh generation tools do not allow you to put a hole in a mesh. So for example, um, Gary worked on a model with the California Department of Resources when they were looking at what happened if one of the really huge reservoirs in California had failed because part of its um, overflow was um, spillway was getting undermined a couple years ago. And they made a big mesh that went down the, um, down the river and then opened up into the Central Valley. And in the middle of Central Valley, there's, there's, there's a, uh, a very tall mountain that is like really, really tall compared to the, quite beautiful, that's a good thing to ride a bike around, um, but it's not ever gonna get flooded. So when they were doing kind of large cells around it, but in the middle of that, they would they might say, well, you know what? The water's never gonna get over, you know, a thousand feet because like Orville's is not above a thousand feet. So instead, we, but we don't have the ability to put a hole in a mesh. So what they could, what they did, what they could do is just draw a line around the, uh, that's here butte and say, let's just use a really large cells in the middle of that because they're never gonna get wet anyways. And then we'd end up with less cells in our matrix and then have a better compute times. So the standard case is I'm looking to refine, but I also want you to know you can also unrefine. And if there's really a place where you do not care about, you can say, let's have less computation points there. Um, here's another case where uh, a, a, an example of a fairly detailed model where we have um, a background um, cell spacing over here, and then we've kind of taken over what happens in the, in the river portion here, where we've got two rivers coming together, and um, we have put in the combination of brake lines and refinement regions to end up with the cells along the river kind of going in the direction of the river. Um, and if you think about like flow nets that you would have made maybe in a groundwater hydrology class, um, then um, it was a similar concept. We, we want our mesh to generally flow with the river. It does work if it's not lined up with it, but it is better if it is. Um, the 2D flow editor um, has, uh, it shows a list of all the things that are connected to it. And if you have a model, um, sometimes these 2D areas can be large and there could be, I think I've seen over 500 connections to a 2D area before. Um, and you know, when you get to end, end up with huge models like that, it's easier to find things graphically rather than through scrolling through a list of buttons. But um, there is this, this portion of the thing right here that we'll show you all the things that we think are connected to it. So if, if you think you have something connected, but you come here and look and it's not there, then it is, there will be no water passing between the two. So that's another, another way to verify that the connections are working out the way you want them to. Okay, now we're back into RASMAPR. That window was over in the um, old, the BB6 version of how to enter 2D areas. Um, in the RASMAPR window, that's this one we're looking at right here. Um, the, so we got notes here. The final mesh is based on the final computation point set. And you can arrive at that a couple of different ways, like I said before, that um, you could just paste them all in through this one table button right there, not usually done. Or you could start off with the spacing like here. That is usually the way it's done. 
um, you could generate computation points with all the break lines, or you um, could say, well, eh, I don't want to. Use, I just wanted to fill the area with 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 points that use the break lines, <clears throat> and use the second button. Um, generally, I won't be doing that. Usually, it's, it's the first one thing you'd be doing. Um, when you're in this mode, you end up you are doing them all at once, and the um, this is a great place to start. But when there are problems, you might have to go in and hand edit some things. And if you have hand edit, hand edited some points, some cell centers around some break lines to get them so that they match up the way you want, if you come back and hit this button right here, then all that work will be lost. It'll it'll go back to the default. So um, and I, when you push this button, it'll come back and say, "Really, really? Are you sure you want to do that?" So you think about that before you say yes. If you have invested time hand massaging things, that would be gone if you push that button there. Um, Generally, what it's done is you start off with this. You put the break lines in where you think they are, put in spacing, hit compute here, and then whatever problems they are, then you go handle them one at a time, and you, you don't come back here and regenerate it all again. <clears throat> and that's what we're going to be talking about now, uh, mostly for the rest of the way in, is kind of what happens when you don't get what you ask for. Um, so in this case, we have a polyline that... Um, has this curvature here. So it looks like we have a background spacing of like 100 feet or something, but the curvature, the, the looks like the radius of the curvature-ish, however you want to define that, looks like to be more like about 50 feet than 100. So it looks like, so 100 from there to there, or not 100 from there to there, um, that when we did try to make the points that, that followed this curve, it did not work to go well. So what you would do normally in this situation is you would come back in and say, I want to refine that whole thing and I want to use a smaller point spacing, um, something like 50 feet. And then we'd end up with maybe something that looks like that, in which case that looks pretty good. We call that victory and move on. Um, also, things to note is you, um, you don't have to do that. You could uh, to go add points one at a time by hand and just try to follow this kind of pattern where you're putting one point on either side kind of diagonally offset from each other and put them all in that way and do your own um, break line enforcement. Um, usually that's not done, but you could do that. And that's, that is all that it's doing. It is cleverly adding points along the break line so that the snapping can move things to where we want it to be. <clears throat> um, one disadvantage, uh, okay, uh, no, I guess we'll see that later, that you could end up with um, cells that have more than eight sides, in which case you'd have to go and fix that. Uh, here's an example. Can I ask a question about the first line? The first line, yes. So just this one, so for the refinement region, it looks like uh, we may specify the parameter like uh, making the cells go from like 50 to 100. It only applies to the direction like uh, across that line. So if uh, you okay, look this, at the... You can, yeah, this is not a refinement the, region. This is... Not to the right. Yes. So at the two ends of those lines, you can see very small cells right next to pretty big cells. It seems we have uh, no right, control right there. over there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is needed. So if you think about how the Delaunay triangulation works that I was talking about uh, last hour is that I need the face to be halfway between the, the cell and the next cell. Um, so if that when I, um, th these, these two points were added at the end of the break line so that we would end up with the faces, uh, that we would end up with a face that ended at the end of the break line. Um, if you wanted, if you're, this is not a great transition here. It would, it would compute okay, but I would be, I might be tempted to add a few more compute by hand, add some, add some points out over here. Is that what you're worried about? Right, right, right. Seems we have no control of the transition at the end, the both end. Uh, that is a limitation. It does. This is what you're seeing. This is what it does. And um, if you're not happy with that, you can go and massage it by hand. Um, other things that we could do um, th is that you, you notice from like this is we're happy with this, right? And we're happy with this. And so where, where are we not happy? We're not happy from like right here down to right there. So one of the things we could go back to, we could we could go do is we could go take our our, um, our break line and we could uh, go use some of those geoprocessing tools and, and clip and make it into three parts. And we could say, well, actually I'm happy up to like right here down to like right there. 
So I'll make this one a break line and then a break line that goes along here and then another one that goes along like here. And then on just in the middle one, we could have just refined that one. That way we wouldn't, we wouldn't have ended up with all these extra cells out over here if we didn't want them and all the way down here. And we wouldn't have had that, that transition problem. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so as you start tinkering with this, you will develop a strategy that works, you know, that worked well for you. That you, when you start tackling these problems for the you know, second and third time, it'll be a lot easier. Um, a common problem is that in the process of enforcing those break lines, that the mesh generator does not know about the limitation uh, that of eight cells, of eight faces per cell. It just follows those rules we talked about with uh, Delaunay triangulation followed by a Veroni diagram. And it could be that the solution to the Veroni diagram um, ends up being like what we look, we see here in that this cell center um, ends up having more than eight sides. And what do you do about that? Um, there's an automated way to, to, to fix it. And um, you could do that, or you could just go add another point. So maybe in this cell right here, I might be tempted to just add another point like right there. Um, on this one, I think I might be tempted to move this one over a little bit and then add a point right there. Um, but when, you are, when you're in edit mode, it'll show you what you're going to get in a small region, and you can see that you're, whether or not your fix is going to work. <clears throat> um, but you won't know for certain until you get out of edit mode and then remix the full mesh. Um, oh, there we go. Add a point there, split that, and so on. Okay, so another common problem is um, how we meet the boundaries. And this is a common problem that um, uh, if you have a sharp boundary that juts into the mesh, um, the mesh generation will fail to find that to find the perimeter well. And this results in something that looks like this. And we have a hard time, we know that there's a problem and we don't really know what the solution is, but we can kind of tell you, hey, over here, you need to go look at that. So one of the cells, maybe maybe all of them, or just a couple of them, or maybe just one of them over here, where there's a problem like this, would will be uh, flagged red. And what you do, you have a couple things you could do, is you could just go put in a couple points in an arc around the the edge of that sharp point, and that would you could make that work. Um, or you could go to the perimeter polyline and say, is it really important that it actually is that sharp? And if it is, if it really is that sharp, then you, then I would just I wouldn't I wouldn't round it off. Um, but if it was kind of just made by made up by hand because there's a mountain ridge over here, and I'm just worried about flow going in some um, tributary little stream or something, then I, I would I would just round this out right like that. <clears throat> so this is a really common situation, and um, the way you fix it is go and by adding more cells around kind of an arc around the sharp edge, or and or rounding off the sharp edge. 